A surprising number of the second wave's radical feminists were women philosophers. So T. Grace Atkinson, Mary Daly, Janice Raymond, Marilyn Fry, Claudia Card, Jeffner Allen, uh, and Sarah Lucia Hoagland. I'm going to talk about one of these women in particular uh, in this talk, namely Hoagland, and her book Lesbian Ethics, which was published in 1988. In a review of Hoagland's book, Marilyn Fry sums up quite nicely the motivation for the book. She says that women in her lesbian community at the time were hungry for ethics because, and I quote her, we have in significant ways and degrees left behind the values we grew up with and are trying now to make decisions, choices and judgments pretty much without the guidance of a system of values we can accept and endorse. We fall back, of course, into habits of action and interaction which express the values of patriarchy, but we're very displeased when we realise we have done that. We want a new and different ethics to fill the void so that we will have a positive alternative and can know what to do and have some confidence when we have acted that we have done right. So what Fry is pointing to is that lesbians at the time already had to reject a large component of the patriarchal and heterosexist dominant society's values and strike out on their own in order to become lesbians, in order to become feminists. As Hoagland put it, there is something in each lesbian that questions the norm at some level and starts us on our own path. But it's hard to simply leap into the value abyss. We still want to know how to act rightly. We want to know what is a good way to live and a bad way to live. What's the right way to treat people and the wrong way to treat people. And this is what Hoagland tries to do in her book, to clear a path for new value that is neither patriarchal nor heterosexist and which is made conceptually possible, she thinks, by lesbians existing in community together. So the subtitle of the book, as you can see, is Toward New Value. Hoagland has some interesting ideas, and I'm going to focus on two of them. So the first is the idea of ethical action in conditions of oppression. And then the second is the kinds of reasons that she gives for rejecting what are uh, or were at the time commonly accepted values within the lesbian community and also outside of it, and yet which she thought were taking women in a really bad direction. Before I talk about those two ideas, let me just say a little bit more about how Hoagland is thinking about what a lesbian is, because we know that today's usage of the term to refer to a sexual orientation was not the second wave as usage of the term, which tended to refer to a feminist of a certain kind. So Hoagland says that when she started out, she believed that feminism was the theory and lesbianism the practice, but that she became dissatisfied with this and began to want lesbianism the theory. So this shows that she is not equating lesbianism with feminism. She does not simply mean women who are feminists and who choose to center women regardless of their attractions, fantasies, and sexual behaviors. Rather, she says, I mean to contrast lesbianism and heterosexualism. But heterosexualism doesn't just mean being straight and having male, female, procreative sex. It means, and I quote her again, an entire way of life promoted and enforced by every formal and informal institution of the father's society, from religion to pornography to unpaid housework to medicine. So this is feminist, but it's more focused on the enforcement of heterosexuality as a norm of femininity than kinds of feminism focused more broadly or focused more on other aspects of these norms. Hoagland sees lesbianism as a challenge to heterosexualism, and that, to her, means lesbianism is a challenge to male domination of female people, whether that domination takes the form of men as predators or men as protectors. She says, 
Heterosexualism is a way of living that normalizes the dominance of one person in a relationship and the subordination of another. As a result, it undermines female agency. She doesn't think that heterosexualism is the cause of oppression, but she does think that no moral revolution that leaves it in place could possibly succeed. Okay, still in saying all that and in trying to get a sense of what she means by lesbian, she's explicit about refusing to define it. She gives two reasons for this. One is that things that are the norm don't need a definition. So witness today, for example, how everyone is desperately scrambling to define woman, and yet there is virtually no discussion about how to define man. Man remains the norm, and so therefore doesn't need defining. And Hoagland's new value wants the lesbian to be the norm, and therefore lesbian should not be, or should not need to be, defined. The second reason she gives is that once we try to define a thing, we get sucked into adjudicating who counts and who doesn't. But she thinks there's a background assumption behind this that we can trust lesbians and we can't trust non-lesbians. And that's why we need to know who's in and who's out. But she says it's just not true that we can trust all lesbians. We can trust some people and not others and there's no shortcut to figuring out who to trust. So we can let go of this urge to defend our borders from invasion, to think of our community as a fortress. Okay, although she refers in the book to lesbian community, I'm gonna use the terms lesbian feminism and lesbian feminist community from now on uh, instead, just to try to make her understanding as clear as possible. Okay, so let's talk about her ideas. First, agency under oppression. So Hoagland thinks that lesbians being together in community creates a certain possibility, and that is the possibility for a certain kind of exercise of agency, which means a way of making choices in the world. Lesbians were oppressed, at least at her time of writing, which, remember, would have been a few years prior to 1988. She wrote, Lesbians are beaten up, denied jobs, denied housing, denied custody of children. We are expelled from universities, put in mental hospitals, experimented on, murdered, and face every brutality which anyone faces under any form of oppression. What this means for her is that we have to take seriously that we're not talking about conditions in which we as lesbians have full control over our lives. So it was a standard assumption of moral philosophy at the time that moral agency and so moral responsibility required this kind of control. I have a range of reasonable options, I can choose which of those options to take up, and every time I choose a bad one, it's true that I could have done otherwise. When all those things are true, I'm responsible for what I do. But Hoagland is asking about different conditions where we do not have full control over our lives precisely because we are oppressed. But still she thinks choice is possible even when our choices are limited by oppressive circumstances and that makes those limited choices the way that we exercise agency. So the way she puts this is to say we can affect situations even if we can't fully control them. This takes her into thinking about the moves women can make even under the most restricted of circumstances. So she talks about sabotage, doing things to set back the plans of those who are restricting you. So one example that she gives is the housewife in Alex Kate Shulman's Memoirs of an Ex-Prom Queen, who puts raw eggs instead of boiled eggs into her husband's lunchbox. And another is the woman in the documentary, Woman to Woman, saying that she buys things she doesn't need with the grocery money and hoards them just to know you're alive, to make sure you exist. Hoagland also talks about suicides by those in concentration camps, slaves breaking their tools, and battered women killing their husbands. And all of these are attempts by the individual to resist being absorbed into the will of another. She writes, in situations in which a woman makes such choices, 
often she acts to differentiate herself from the will of the one who dominates. The one who dominates may be able to severely restrict the range of her choices, he may physically threaten her, he may have legal power of life and death over her, but it is yet another matter for him to totally control her, to make her believe that she is nothing but an extension of his will. So this all relates to lesbian feminism in that it would be very hard for a woman living under heterosexualism to do much alone. She'll struggle to maintain her sense of self and her acts of individual re resistance or sabotage are likely to be interpreted as her simply being crazy. And she can't make much of an actual difference by herself, but in community with others, much more is possible. Hoagland writes, femininity is a concept which goes a long way in the social construction of heterosexual reality. A movement of women could withdraw from that framework and begin to revalue that reality and women's choices within it. A movement of women can challenge the feminine stereotype, discover women's resistance and provide a base for a more effective resistance. A movement of women can challenge the consensus that made the individual act of sabotage plausible. But to challenge the consensus, women need to challenge femininity. And that means challenging heterosexualism as she understands it, which is the dominant subordination relation between men and women, including but not limited to their sexual relations. Lesbian feminists can do this in community together, and one of the ways they can do it is through separatism, stepping outside of the patriarchal value framework, decolonizing their bodies, and creating new meaning together, and from there, creating new values. Okay, now her second idea, which is about the values that might at first seem good and suitable for use inside lesbian feminist communities, but in fact she thinks are destructive. So these include altruism, self-sacrifice and vulnerability, which she says are all examples of control from a position of subordination, and then also duty, obligation and justice, which she says are all about social control and they have us acting for the wrong reasons. So about altruism, self-sacrifice and vulnerability, Hoagland says these are values fit for a situation in which there is a conflict of interests and that it will always be those who have less institutional power who are expected to be self-sacrificing. Under patriarchy, men and children are thought to need women and this sets up a conflict of interest where if she acts for herself, she is denying something to them. She has less power. She is expected to sacrifice for them. And Hoagland sees these values exhibited in some women as character traits or as virtues as being survival skills. She writes, because of male domination, over time, women have developed the ascribed feminine virtues into survival skills and created of them tools for control. And this power of manipulation is the essence of female agency promoted under heterosexuality. When lesbians use these virtues against each other, sorry, among each other, we wind up using our survival skills against each other. Thus, our survival skills go awry. The thought is we shouldn't want these virtues in lesbian community because we shouldn't see any conflict of interest between women. We don't want others to give up their goals in order to pursue ours. Rather, we want to support each other in a community of individuals to pursue each of our goals. We want encouragement and criticism and exchange of ideas, not sacrifice. Vulnerability, Hoagland thinks, is also a form of control from a position of subordination. We make ourselves vulnerable as a way of controlling others. Now I have told you what I most hate about myself, you cannot use that against me in any way, otherwise, if you do, you will have betrayed me. This is a way of engineering closeness or fast-tracking a sense of intimacy, but real closeness, real intimacy take time to build up. 
So in place of altruism, self-sacrifice and vulnerability, Hoagland offers us individual integrity and agency. About duty, obligation and justice, these ideas have historically been used for social control. For example, in societies where the highest status goes to the people who can contribute the most to the society. They're ways of curbing those people's excesses and protecting the weaker in terms of status from the stronger. And they're also the ideas that tend to be adjudicated by authorities rather than by the people themselves. So Hoagland thinks that lesbians use these ideas to try to get each other to behave. It was your duty to do these things for me. A good person would do these things and you didn't. So you are bad and wrong. And then we feel justified in punishing each other for wrongdoing, meeting out our own form of justice, where that punishment tends to most commonly inside lesbian communities be social ostracism. And this is controlling. She says it involves the idea that to be accepted back into the fold, a lesbian must accept the mother's judgment of her. But again, going back to the idea just mentioned that we're creating a community of individuals and equals, we, we should not want a lesbian to submit to our judgment of her. She can consider our criticism, but ultimately she must make her own judgment. If we use tactics of control, domination and punishment, then lesbian communities will not have succeeded in getting rid of the dominance relations uh, of heterosexualism. Instead, when conflict arises, we might try to occupy the other's position and see things from her point of view. We might spend more time trying to understand disagreements and less time trying to make judgments upon them. Finally, Hoagland thinks we should not act because we feel it is our duty, but rather because we are connected to each other. These connections will create motivation. So she writes, when we are connected with someone and she's in the hospital, we just visit her. That's part of our connection. If we need duty or obligation as a motive, we haven't a connection. Our relationships are not bargains in return for a few compromises. So in place of duty, obligation and justice, Hoagland offers us caring and connection. It's not a fully worked out new value system, but it's a start and it leaves open what revolutionary moral value might emerge from lesbian communities who make that start. Marilyn Fry in the review I mentioned already has an interesting objection to Hoagland's project. So Fry questions the need for a new ethics uh, at all, as opposed to giving up ethics. She writes, I'm wondering about the need to know what to do and to have confidence that we have acted rightly. Not why we feel we need a new ethics, but why we need an ethics at all. I'm wondering if that need isn't, uh, if that need itself isn't something that could be given up. Indeed, I dare say so, perhaps should be given up. She seems to think that having an ethics is something we can try to grow out of. And she gives some justifications for this idea by talking about her own upbringing in an upwardly mobile and self-consciously Christian and white family and about how this created an in-group who knew right from wrong and had the responsibility to see to it that right was done. And then an out-group that didn't know right from wrong and so should be advised, instructed, helped and directed by us. But she came to worry later that this is a form of class and race domination, casting one's own group with its particular ethical sensibility into the role of judge, teacher slash preacher, director, administrator, manager, decision maker, planner, policy maker, organizer. The feminist in becoming a feminist rejects the ethics of the fathers and discovers her own authority. She comes to understand herself as authorized by her own knowledge of right and wrong. But then she becomes even more invested in a sense of what is right or wrong for her confidence in herself depends on her own authority about that matter. And it means she will be, as Fry puts it, completely demoralized and petrified by the discovery that she does not, after all, know right from wrong. 
But Fry thinks she need not feel that way because lesbian nation does not need a class of citizens whose vocation is to run it. We don't need authorities, we need equality. Fry also asks, given the long association of femininity with goodness, why on earth a feminist woman should want to be good? So Fry thinks that Hoagland's book is frustrating insofar as it promises a new ethics because we should want no ethics instead of new ethics. That she also thinks that Hoagland's book can help us with that alternative because one of her recurring themes is about lesbians being together in community and creating meaning rather than goodness. And in fact, that is already a move away from ethics to something else entirely. Just consider how things that are entirely morally bad may yet be extremely meaningful.